Right, so in the last video, we talked about query complexity, which was how many inputs we had to check of a unknown function before we could answer some question about the properties of that function. The properties we were considering were constant versus balanced. A constant function has the exact same output on every input, so that could be all zero or all one. A balanced function is one that has the same number of zeros and ones. Now, as you can see on the screen, and as you might expect, we're going to introduce quantum query complexity. But we have these Boolean functions. They act on bits and they produce bits. How are we going to quantumly query a function? Well, we know that bits occur inside of these computational basis states. So this is maybe an n qubit state here. And this x is then an n bit string. We might say, try, well, let's just apply the function to that n bit string. That's the one way to apply the Boolean function. And we can do that. However, for the constant function, for example, the one that takes every input to zero, we would have every basis state going to the zero state, which is definitely not reversible and certainly not unitary. So we can't do that. Now it's worth noting that around the time that the deutsch joseph algorithm was invented, people were already thinking about reversible classical computation. And a simple way to create a reversible uh, classical gate or any sort of gate would be to copy the input. So if I copy the input and in another register or some other uh, bits, I compute the function, then of course I can get back to the original input because the input is actually copied in the output. What does that look like in the case of a quantum mechanical system? So we have uh, the, the input to the function x, that's n qubits, and let's uh, create a new register a one qubit register, and that's where we're going to store the output of the function. And the application of this unknown function has to be unitary, so we have some unitary f here. The input gets copied, and the output gets added to this lower scratch qubit. Now, you might be wondering already, well, I mean, I'm copying, potentially copying the input if f is, um, if f is, say, the identity function, then uh, I've copied the, the state x, and we had the no cloning theorem, so how, how could this be possible? Well, remember from the no cloning theorem that it's perfectly fine to copy a ba a, a, an entire basis, so this is something we can do and in fact what we'll do is show some explicit examples of the circuits that implement constant and balanced functions yeah so there's no problem with the no cloning theorem we're just copying bases which is something we can do it's the superpositions that we can't copy let's look at an example let's look at that uh, that function of one bit. So the input can be 0 or 1, and we saw that there were four possible functions uh, 0 to f sub 0 to f sub 3. f sub 0 is the 0, 0 function. f sub 1 is the 0, 1. f sub 2, we're just counting in binary here, but you can see that f0 is the uh, function that takes everything to zero, constant function, f1 is the identity, f2 is the not, and f3 is the constant function that takes everything to one. Now let's see how this circuit has to work. 
So we don't know what u is, but we're going to figure out what u is by looking at um, the input-output relationship and then determining, of course, the input-output relationship of an entire basis specifies the unitary. So once we do that, then we can determine what, what that unitary is. So the input is x, y, right? So these are the, um, the bit values of the input state. And the output is going to be x and y plus f of x. So we'll look at what that is for f0, f1, f2, and f3. Now, since we've introduced this scratch qubit, there's actually four potential inputs, 0, 1, 1, 0, yeah, 1, 0, and 1, 1, okay. And let's uh, slowly go through what what should go in each of these each of these boxes. The first one is actually the easiest. So you can see x gets copied. So we could fill in half the table immediately by just copying x. X the first qubit register does not change. For that first entry, we have x and then y plus f of x. y is 0, f is 0 is 0 from up here, so 0 plus 0 equals 0. In the second row we have 0 because x doesn't change. Now we have y is equal to 1 and f of 0 is st still 0, 1 plus 0 is 1. Uh, now we have x equals 1, x doesn't change, y equals 0, and f of 1 is 0. We're looking at the constant function that just takes all inputs and produces 0. So we have y plus y equals 0 plus f of x, um, f of 1, which is 0, so 0 plus 0, that's 0. In the last row, x is 1, x doesn't change. And in the second register, we have 1 plus 0, which is 1. So that's the uh, how the quantum circuit acts, this quantum circuit acts, uh, if we have f sub 0. Okay, so now is a good chance to say, pause the video. Oh wait, I should tell you what you should do. Ah, yeah, pause the video and try to fill in some more of the boxes in this table. Yeah, now, now I'll pause. Okay, good. So your table should be filled in. My table's not, so let's fill in my table. Remember, the x value doesn't change, so let's just fill in the x value, 0, 0, 1, 1. The y value for the second qubit in this first row is 0, and for f sub 1, f of 0 is 0, that's 0, and 1. Now we have f, so, uh, f acting on the 1 bit is 1, so we have 0 plus 1, that's 1. And, well, the last one must be 0 because um, the, the uh, circuit must be unitary. We could determine what it is, but um, the last one has to be orthogonal to all the other ones. F2, we have 0, 0, 1, 1 for the x value. The x value doesn't change. Now, f of 0 is 1, y is 0, so that is 1, the next one must be 0. Now we have y of 0 is 1, but f of, sorry, y is 0, 
f of 1 is 0 for f sub 2, and that means that this is 0. And the last one must be 1. Okay. Finally, we have 0, 0, 1, 1 for the x value. y is 0. And now we're looking at the constant function which, in which f of x is always 1. So we have 0 plus 1, 1, 1 plus 1, 0. And y equals 0, f of 1 is 1. That's 1 and 0. All right, that's the whole table filled in. That's the action of the quantum oracle circuit on the one-bit functions. Now we ask, what exactly is this circuit? And what does this circuit look like? Well, for this one, we can see that the input and the output don't change. So in fact, this is the identity circuit. So for the function f sub 0, the identity function, uh, or the, the, all, the all 0, the constant 0 function, we have the identity circuit. So we would actually, inside of this box, be implementing nothing at all, the identity. So this one we recognize as well. Um, we have when the first qubit is 0, nothing changes, but when the first qubit is 1, the second qubit flips. That is a C0. So that circuit is that one there. Here we have when the first qubit is 0, the second qubit flips, and when the first qubit is 1, nothing happens. So this we can write as C0 followed by an extra not gate happening on the second qubit. So we have C naught and then uh, an extra not gate. And finally here uh, of course we have nothing happening on the first qubit but on the second qubit we're flipping the y value so that's identity tensor x. Alright so that's how you can quantumly query a black box. It has to be some unitary implementation. And what, what we mean by black box is simply that what is happening, the circuit, the quantum circuit that's happening inside of this U sub F box is just one of the four of these. And the question will be, how many times do we need to apply this circuit before we can answer the question of whether or not it's implementing a constant versus balance function. And we'll see in the next video that the answer is one query.